Coming up on DTNS, David Spark talks about how the security industry can benefit from more diversity. Foxconn ramps production back up to normal and a Danish robot that kills everything. Like, like in infectious diseases, not people. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, March 12th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And uh, I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. As I mentioned, David Spark, producer of the CISO series, is back with us. Welcome back, David. Good to have you back, man. It is great to be back here. And I, I apologize. I, I usually am on for you the annual you know, RSA wrap-up show. And I literally, RSA passed, and I... I was like, oh, geez, I didn't contact you guys. So <laughs> well, I'm glad, but I'm, I'm on a few weeks after the time. No problem. No problem. We were just talking to, to David about uh, so, so some of the coverage that's happening in the world around security. We were also talking about pie and fear of trains. You can get all of that in the wider <laughs> show, A Good Day Internet. Become a patron at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. TikTok owner ByteDance says it set a goal to increase its headcount from 60,000 to 100,000 employees by the end of the year. The company also appointed monetization head Zhang Lidong as the chairman and short video app Douyin head Kelly Zhang, uh, Kelly Zhang Nan, chief executive of its China business. Both will report to the company's founder and global CEO, Zhang Yiming, who will shift focus to the company's global expansion plans. A new research note from Apple analyst Ming-Chi Kuo predicts that the new MacBook Air and Pro models with scissor switch keyboards will arrive in Q2 of this year. In the note, Kuo predicted Apple will release a MacBook with a custom processor in Q4 of this year, or possibly in Q1 2021, and introduce an update design on some MacBooks in Q2 or Q3 of next year, 2021. Twitter changed its COVID-19 response policy, now requiring all employees to work from home after previously recommending it. The company will continue to pay contractors and hourly wage workers to cover standard working hours during the disruption. The release of Call of Duty Warzone and its 18 to 23 gigabyte download, combined with an increasing number of people working from home and using video conferencing, leading to record traffic peaks at Internet Exchanges Tuesday. Internet Exchange Points, or IXPs, exchange traffic between ISPs and content delivery networks. DECIX in Frankfurt, Germany, reported an all-time high traffic peak of more than 9.1 terabits per second on Tuesday. That is one of the busiest IXPs in the world. Uh, Community IX in Austin reported record traffic, as did several other European IXPs. Let's talk a little bit about Magic Leap. Bloomberg sources say that the augmented reality startup Magic Leap is exploring strategic options, including a potential sale. Other options include selling a significant stake in the company or even a partnership. Magic Leap raised $2.6 billion in venture funding, and the sources say that a sale could be worth more than $10 billion, with Magic Leap reportedly courting companies such as Facebook and Johnson & Johnson. I have been skeptical... <sighs> Put it this way: I've thought Magic Leap was a little overhyped from the beginning. Well, they uh, had and themselves some awesome publicity at the, right out of the gate. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, so I'm not shocked that they would sell. There's some hints in this Bloomberg article, though, David, that it relates to supply chain problems because of the virus and possibly uh, issues because of the tariffs in in making affordable hardware. Uh, that very well could be the the problem. But again, those are all. God willing, temporary problems. Problem, and and by the way, tariffs did not affect a lot of other industries out here. May uh, affected manufacturing out in China, but given that like our relationships with China might have soured, like I know in the the commercial real estate industry, especially in California, where there's a lot of Chinese purchasing, it did not affect that at all. So, you know, going for a quick sale because of something that is a known to be a temporary issue, I don't know if I buy that. No, well, if you can get $10 billion for it, uh, maybe. Yes. I, it seems like a very high uh, valuation. Uh, maybe they, they mentioned Magic Leap was interested in Johnson Johnson, augmented reality big in the health field. Maybe they can get Magic Johnson to invest in. Ah, uh, I see what you did there. <laughs> Protocol sources say the license for Google's Android TV OS prevents companies from using forked versions of Android, like Fire TV OS, on other devices they make. Uh, breaking the agreement would result in an OEM losing access to the Play Store, Google services, apps, et cetera, on all 
devices. This is a known issue with phones, but protocol pointing out that it is also putting a break on people adopting Fire TV as an operating system on TVs. The terms apply to all devices made by an OEM. So an Android phone maker, like Samsung, for instance, could not use Fire TV OS on non-phone products like a Samsung television, for instance. Google previously announced it had a deal with about six of the 10 smart TV manufacturers and 140 cable TV operators to use Android TV. Samsung's not a great example because they have their own Tizen OS that they use. Uh, but other manufacturers would like to use Android and might decide to have both if they were allowed to. Europe has gotten in trouble for this, or Europe has fined Google for this sort of thing before. 4.34 billion euros uh, when it found the policy was anti-competitive as it related to phone manufacturing. Now, Google is appealing that decision, but in the meantime, let's European economic area companies make forked smartphones and tablets as a concession. But nothing in that concession says anything about televisions. Uh, so I would expect that we will see this issue surface. Uh, probably that the folks tipping off protocol that this is happening are interested in getting some regulatory examination of this in Europe or some possibly somewhere else. Yeah, we were talking before the show of, well, if Google already has gotten in trouble in Europe for this and they're having to make concessions, even though it's still sort of an ongoing case uh, as it's going to shake out eventually, well, you know, why, why would they try it again? And I think we, we're at the point where <laughs> Google, much like many other large companies, just sort of see how long they can get away with it before enough people complain and they and they have to roll some 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 strategies back. It's interesting well, that Amazon hasn't pushed the issue. Yeah, David. Well, I, you know, from that article, they they uh, they talk at great length about the the how Amazon and Google have been each other's throats, and although it's being sold right now, or you know, that looks like an old one, but that they Amazon stopped selling the Chromecast for a period of time, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, and there was a, I, a battle over YouTube uh, being on on the Amazon Echo Show, which has finally been resolved as well. Um, and, anyway, it's, it's it's been ongoing, but. All of this just screams anti-competitive behavior per, you know, what you were saying in Europe. And I mean, this even harks back to what I was thinking, you know, when Internet Explorer was being distributed on PCs and that was the default browser at the time. Well, um, I, this is worse. This is this is as yeah. if Microsoft said, uh, if you sell a computer with Internet Explorer on it, you can't install any other browsers, uh, which I don't know, maybe they did have that. Well, I don't remember that. You, you can't by default, but then again, I guess anyone can you know, purchase a fire stick. Or that, stick. or actually, no, this is worse. This is, you can't sell laptops with other operating systems on them, which honestly, right. back then, not a big deal. There weren't any uh, other than Linux. Uh, you right. know, there weren't any tempting other operating systems. Uh, but this does put a break on Fire TV and it, and it does sort of take away the spirit of Android as an open operating system. Uh, if someone's out there bullying people into not using other operating systems based on on the Android open source system. Completely agreed, and I'm sure this go on. But w what was also described in that article is how unbelievably complicated this is. And in general, your average consumer is not going to be able to catch up with any of this. They're not going to notice, yeah, because they no. just won't see the options on the shelf. Moving on to killer robots. Although, you know, it depends on what you're killing. Maybe not so dangerous. Denmark's UVD Robots makes rolling autonomous robots with UV lights that have been operating in Chinese medical facilities for the past few weeks. This is how it works. UVD Robots use ultraviolet sea light to shred the DNA and RNA of any microorganism. UVC light can be dangerous to humans, and human operators of lights may miss spots where robots are less likely to, so they really come in handy in this case. The robots have LiDAR among with the UV lamps. A human drives it around once to create a digital map so the robot knows what the, what the scene is, then annotates the spots on the map that the robot should clean. The robot can then automatically leave its charging station, go clean up stuff, shut off lights if it detects a person, and once it's done cleaning, return to its charging station. It takes about 10 to 15 minutes to disinfect each room, killing 99.99% of germs. The company is shipping robots by air freight to China every week, and hundreds of them are in tests in more than 40 countries now. Each robot costs eighty to $90,000. Yeah, we were uh, kind of all impressed at, you know, for hospital equipment, uh, how affordable this this is uh, and and a good thing to have because secondary infections and in, in hospitalization are are a big problem 
and the ability to, to keep things clean. And, you know, 99.99 is not all the germs, but it's an improvement in a lot of cases over what's there. You know, I interviewed years ago the CEO of the Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital in Boston, and he was one of the first CEOs that I know of, of a hospital to start just blogging regularly. And he publicly disclosed their central line infection rates without discussing this with his lawyers. Mm. And his lawyers got a little upset. But because of his brutal level of honesty on that subject, he kind of became a rock star in the industry <laughs> as a result. Anyways, but then he... It it created a type of um, internal pressure as well of, oh, we need to fix this. And they did improve things. And then he published the better results. Foxconn founder Terry Gutaiming said Thursday that resumption of production at factories in China has exceeded expectations, saying supplies to its plants in China and Vietnam have returned to normal. Uh, Foxconn's concern has now shifted from production to demand. Uh, is there enough demand? Are we going to see weakening demand in, in the United States, Europe, et cetera, uh, based on, on virus effects? Uh, that is the impact Foxconn is concerned with, as well as some supply chain issues arising from Korea and Japan regarding getting enough RAM and display panels to assemble the uh, devices. Meanwhile, Nikkei Asian Review notes that stocks of iPads are running low in China as families buy them for help with e-learning at home in response to school closures. Nikkei's source says Apple has ordered a 20% increase in iPad production as a result, and some Huawei tablets are limited to one purchase per person as supplies of those are also dwindling. Yeah, interesting to see, you know, as we continue to monitor the whole idea of people being home a lot more and how that's affecting the world, really, the whole idea of, well, kids not in school, need more tablets. Uh, that that makes a lot of sense, but the numbers are interesting. I'm glad to see Foxconn back up to speed. Uh, that's this true. is this is three months in, you know, from the from the outbreak in China, uh, and not that, you know, past performance is a guarantee of future, future performance, but, uh, this is, this is good news. And it, and it means that a lot of this production that people are worried about is coming back. Uh, mm -hmm. it's an indicator of that. So, you know, it's, it's good to see some, some positive news uh, out of this. David, what do you make of all this? You know, people getting back to work, of course, it's positive news, especially with the rest of us are all of a sudden sort of not stopping work, but have greatly altered our life plans. And actually, what am I saying? Many people's lives ha have stopped. I mean, sure. it's it's a bizarre, weird time. So anytime we can see something positive coming from someone who had to halt production, where it's, it's a, a light at the end of our tunnel now. And like you say, uh, Sarah, that tablet uh, demand in China shows sort of that uh, the, the unexpected uh, the unanticipated consequences of this. We're in uncharted territory. We don't know where the demand is going to ebb and flow because we've we've never been in anything quite like this uh, before. Yeah. So that's that's an interesting example of of the kind of thing to be on the lookout for. It's interesting too the the temporary spikes that certain industries are seeing and then the lack of demand that other industries are seeing. You know, depending on what you're talking about, right? It's like there are things that are sold out in grocery stores right now. I iPads and other tablets that that make use of certainly classroom stuff, but all sorts of things that 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 just make it more convenient because you're not out and about, you're not going to the office, that sort of thing. It's it's these temporary spikes where companies might say, "Oh gosh, now we have to ramp up real quick," but but knowing that this might be pretty temporary, but again, temporary short term is a very subjective term right now because we don't we just don't know is this you know you say, say sort of like okay you got to plan for the next couple quarters next couple weeks next well, year well i'll tell you i mean it just happened with me i mean i just landed another sponsor and they they honestly said oh uh well we're not doing many live events coming up so i've got all this budget that we spend on live events Interesting. we're yeah. going to now advertise on your podcast and i was like well that's fortuitous to me it's kind yeah. of unfortunate but yeah right, right? <laughs> and but, it's the sort of thing that you don't want to get too used to, right? Because, you know, when oh, things go back not. to normal, it, yeah. You know, I mean, literally that's how they describe why they all, and, and you know, they just came out of nowhere. It's like, oh, we want a sponsor, like out of the blue. 
Yeah. No, the resources are going to go in different areas. Uh, not all resources will go away. Some will be down and delayed. Absolutely. There will be shortages. But uh, it's interesting to think of that. As we're recording this right now, the NCAA just announced they're canceling the March tournament. Uh, Disneyland just finally announced that they're closing. Uh, more of these public events here in the United States uh, are are being temporarily delayed, shut down, Major League Baseball, the NHL, the NBA. Uh, so there is going to be a demand for entertainment in other areas for people who are working from home or quarantined uh, and can't spend the money that they would normally spend on these other events. It'll be interesting to see how that all affects technology. Well, speaking of maybe being stuck inside and wanting to <laughs> be entertained, Blade announced its ga cloud gaming service Shadow will launch a VR exploration program, which is a closed beta for VR gaming on April 1st. Signups begin March 13th with a second round on March 24th. The program is only compatible with the Oculus Quest, at least currently, and Shadow recommends a fiber connection with 100 megabits down and at least 20 megabits up, a ping under 15 milliseconds, and 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi router. Shadow also Introduced its new pricing tiers to the U.S., which start at $11.99 per month for a 12-month 4K gaming subscription, with more powerful plans coming later this year. LG also announced a partnership with Blade to offer Shadow on some of its products. This is a good move by Blade. Uh, Shadow, I think you could easily dismiss as, you know, the 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 problem of the first mover advantage. Yes, they had a very compelling, very powerful cloud platform. Patrick Beja has been great about keeping us up to date on, on what it does. Uh, but instead of falling as Stadia, GeForce Now, Project X Cloud uh, come along, they're working hard to say, we want to stay ahead of the game. We're going to provide virtual reality because what we do is offer you a powerful computer in the cloud and that powerful computer can run a VR headset. So if you've got a Quest, plug it in and we can power it in the cloud. If you, you know, and if you got want to do 4K gaming, we can do that. Partnering with LG to say like, let's just build it into televisions. Let's just build it into other devices and phones. Uh, I, I think this is this is smart and it shows that I'm, I'm not saying Shadow will win this war, but they are they're definitely not going to to just fade away. And nobody nobody plays any video games, do they? Uh, you know what? Here's well, let me let me can I just back up a little bit because you know the first time we saw virtual reality was you know sticking the damn phone to our head, which was the most bizarre thing. But uh, let me ask both of you: What is the longest you put a virtual reality headset on your head for? Like, what's the longest duration? You've I, done? I mean, I'm the wrong person to ask. Uh, what, what, well, uh, throw in Roger. Roger, what was the longest you've done? You're more of a gamer than any of us, I think. Um, I have used it all of one twice, and that was with the original Oculus uh, okay. back in the day when when we had one in the uh, at the Revision Three um, lab. So, but like, how long did it stay on your head? So you used it twice, so that's not really. Yeah, I mean, like 15, 20 minutes. Okay. I mean, so it was that, it, there was no real games at the time. There was just a lot yeah. of demos. So, I mean, there wasn't okay. too much meandering about for me. Anyways, VR is going to need its killer app. Like everything, like everything. Well, like yeah, that's still, like that's still TV true. Needed but Milton Berle. I always bring I'm not trying to say up. VR will save Shadow, but they are, <laughs> they are definitely distinguishing themselves by offering things that that are out there people people like the quest people use the quest and uh and so this is this is not the killer app for shadow but it's another thing that they will be doing that other services aren't yet uh in fact a lot of those other services way slower right, right now there's no restrictions on shadow as far as what you can play unlike geforce now uh it's it's a it's a much more powerful system than stadia at least at the moment because it's offering you control over an actual computer. I mean, you can run Office on this thing. You can run video editing apps on, on this thing if you want. So um, I think it's interesting to keep an eye on, for sure. Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. On Thursday, Australia's CyberCX, uh, which is a recent merger of 12 top security brands there, announced it's going to fund 12 scholarships to support women who enroll in university or what they call TAFE, Technical and Further Education, uh, for cybersecurity programs. CyberCX also partnering with the Australian Women's Security Network, the Australian Women in Security Awards. Uh, we see the Lowy Institute calling for more review about diversity in the security industry, noting the U.S. Office of the Director of National Intelligence releases an annual demographic report here in the U.S., that examines the hiring and retention of minorities, women, and persons with disabilities across the entire 17 agency intelligence community in the U.S. 
these are just examples from today of how the security industry is paying attention to diversity. But but I know, uh, David, there's been some folks who say that diversity can be an impediment. Uh, what do you get if you pursue diversity in security? Why is it needed? So uh, there's there's diversity in people and there's a diversity in thought. And, and I'm quoting my uh, co-host from our, our show, Defense in Depth, Alan Alford, uh, who said that um, the key thing is diversity in thought, in thought, and you usually get diversity in thought when you go diversity in people, because people who are from diverse backgrounds have diverse experiences. And the whole thing with cybersecurity is to be able to look at problems and issues from different angles. If everyone comes from the pl same place, the same background, the same experiences, you do not get that. And therefore, you don't become, quote, secure. You're not looking at the gamut of possibilities that can happen, you're only looking at a sector. And that's, that's, I would say, is at the most basic level, the main argument for the need for diversity in cybersecurity. So how do you build a diverse team then? How do you, how do you, how do you get the right team that's actually really good at this, but also bringing in those benefits? So one of the, the major arguments I, I heard is, you, you have to start building your diverse team from day one because um, non-diversity sort of feeds on itself. And we kind of know this whenever we do hiring, like you hire that one person and to then hire the second person, you ask that one person, who do you know, who would be good? Well, the majority of us kind of hang out with people that are from kind of our ba same backgrounds in general. I know this is, I'm highly generalizing, don't, mm -hmm. but that mm -hmm. often is the case because we, we usually, you know, connect with people who are like-minded with us. Um, so what happens if you do that, then there's a kind of like a snowball effect. You just start hiring the same kind of person over time. So the big, the best argument I've heard is if you want to hire diverse talent, you start now when you uh, building, I guess, your network, uh, your connections, your relations, when you're not hiring. This is just kind of like a general good networking advice. Uh, you know, like, you know, how do you find your next job? Network. Well, do it when you don't need your next job. Same exact concept when you're in hiring. So on the flip side of that. Is you know, it, I think it... that, uh... oh, go, go ahead, ahead Tom. Sarah. No, no, go ahead, sir. <laughs> okay. Uh, as the token woman on the show today, um, <laughs> I, I feel lucky enough to, you know, when I, when I think about women in security, it's like, oh, wow, I can rattle off lots of really awesome women who are security experts that we work with regularly. I know that that is a novelty for a lot of other people. So when I see something like this, I go, great, more the merrier, you know, anything that is more inclusive, not only for my gender, uh, but um, minorities, anybody with a disability, anybody who feels, you know, on the fringes of what is historically, yeah, I kind of have a white male type of a thing and, and, and very much, uh, you know, kind of at times a real secret club type of a thing. And, and honestly, it, it, and we've all seen this in, in certain cases, uh, there is some animosity towards sort of like that, that kind of idea of like the newcomer. Um, and this sort of, oh, we got to be politically correct and, you know, have everybody, uh, right. you know, everybody's got to be a representative from something at the very beginning. But David, I agree with you. I, I agree that when you, when you're building a team of any kind, uh, the sooner that you get on board with diversity, the better, because it's much harder to add people in later. Yes. And, but more importantly than that, and, and, and this is where you, you kind of get the beginning when you reference, oh, I'm the token woman on the show kind of a thing. If you, let's say, you you build this awesome team that's not diverse and like, oh, crap, I need to hire diversity. How do you think the, those each additional people are going to feel about joining your team? You know, they're going to be not so, quote, comfortable about that because all of a sudden they're the token something else as opposed to an all-white male team. So one of the huge benefits is if you start early, then you don't deal with that problem later on. But also right. something you said earlier too, Sarah, is sometimes the security industry is not welcoming and that mm -hmm. really pushes people away. Uh, yeah. So, and, and we talk about this endlessly about the desire to be more welcoming, to help people in. And I, I will just say this, and, and people who are in cybersecurity who are listening right now, the cybersecurity world is filled with a lot of great people and a lot of jerks at the same time, like in anything. But there's there seems to be an, a, an enormous proportion of those as well. 
Well, we don't think anybody who contributes to our subreddit is a jerk. In fact, we want you to contribute <laughs> to our DNS subreddit. You can submit stories. You can also vote on other stories that are in there that you think are important, that we should know about. DailyTechNewsShow.reddit.com. All right, let's check in with Nate Langson to see why a pig, a pedometer, and a barn fire we all feature prominently on the next text message episode. Guys, one of the things we talked a lot about on this week's show involved a pig, a pedometer, and what happens when the aforementioned pig swallows the aforementioned pedometer. It turns out the answer is it mixes with uh, the animal's excrement and causes a barn to burn down. So we talked about that, the hows, the whys, and also what other kinds of technology are used on British farms. So that's all out now at uktechshow.com. It's a barn burner of an episode there. Oh, God. All right, let's dive into the mailbag. <laughs> let's do it. Todd wrote, uh, in response to our conversation yesterday about Amazon powering uh, the back end of these cashierless stores, especially in airports. Todd says, decades ago, I was a cashier at an airport gift shop. During peak transit times, it wasn't uncommon for me to have a line of 15 or more people waiting to check out, and I was working as fast as possible to crank through at a rate of two to three people per minute if their transactions were simple enough. Being able to walk in, grab something, and just leave would be a huge benefit to those on a tight connection. And yes, it would also alleviate the embarrassment of buying certain items. I can't really think of anything I was embarrassed to buy at an airport, but it does just, it just well, they, makes it more of a, to, a, a seamless they, situation. Do they still sell pornography at airports? I don't even know. I don't know. That's Asking not something. For a friend, David? Yeah, I've never I thought to look, David. I have pornographic magazines at airports being sold. The question is, who needs to take care of themselves on a flight? I don't know. I, well, uh, and I, also, <laughs> you know, it, it really depends on who's sitting next to you, you know? Even if you have it, like, you can, have, like, just open it up and, you know, just so you're like, well, if you want to sit next to me, I'll be reading Playboy. there are other examples of embarrassing items uh, that we could think of, too. You know, uh, if, if someone was, was buying some kind of medicine, uh, you know, with, right. with, and they just felt yeah. self-conscious about the fact that it's like, yeah, yeah, I've got diarrhea. Sorry, i got to buy this. Though. Totally. Um, that sort of exactly. thing, too. But, yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I, uh, I'm very, very curious once this is in place in Newark, uh, if anybody's flying through Newark or once it gets into LaGuardia or elsewhere, uh, if you get a chance to, to try this out, let us know how it works, what you see people buying. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very curious, uh, about them bringing this Amazon, uh, cashierless, just walk out technology to airport convenience stores. Me too. I mentioned yesterday that some of my best friends are cashiers, and Todd, you are now my best friend. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Tim Deputy, Kevin S. Morgan, and Dan Dorado Hankins. Also, thanks to David Spark. David, it's been too long. Where can people keep up with what you've been doing since we saw you last? Uh, well, the big thing is CISOseries.com. Uh, I do two podcasts like you guys do podcasts. Mine are, are not video. But uh, the uh, CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast, which is our most popular one. And then we do Defense in Depth. And we've been doing a lot of live shows. I just got back from shows in Tel Aviv, New York, and Boston. And, well, doesn't look like I'm going to be doing a lot of live shows <laughs> coming up. Uh, in fact, we just had to postpone a bunch of them. Uh, but there will be more coming up. But I would also throw out to the audience, given all our concern around coronavirus, COVID-19, uh, on Friday, we're doing a live video chat. That means it's a it's an open discussion. Anyone who wants to participate, we do that on Crowdcast. You can find the link to that on CISOseries.com. That's going to be tomorrow, uh, Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific time. Excellent. Uh, folks, uh, there's, there's one way to directly support the show. It's the best way to support the show, uh, and that's to become a member of our Patreon. Our Patreon allows us uh, to cut out the middleman and and make sure that we are responding only to the people who want the show to succeed, the people who listen to the show, who get value out of the show. Uh, and so we're very thankful to everybody who supports us on Patreon. And if you have thought about it before and thought, I don't, I don't know if I want to or if I have time, uh, two bucks a month uh, is is the is the first entry in. That's that's barely less even a cup of coffee. Less than a price of coffee. They always yes, exactly. Price of coffee. It's less than a You'll price. You'll still of have money for coffee and support <laughs> the show. Uh, so go check it out, patreon.com slash DTNS.
Man, what I wouldn't do to get a $2 coffee these days. No kidding, right? <laughs> yeah, that's been a while. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We are also live Monday through Friday. That's 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Rob Dunwood and Len Peralta. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>